Hello, good evening everybody. Welcome once again to episode 2 of our National Interest Waiver Green Card Do It Yourself program on YouTube. Uh, my name is Daniel Barr and I'm the host for tonight and uh, this is episode 2. Like I said, uh, this program is geared towards uh, graduate students uh, in and around the world and in the United States who are looking forward to perpetuate their stay in the United States after their research uh, to continue doing whatever they are doing in their field of endeavors, or professionals who are working out of the United States and looking for green card to move their families and move themselves to immigrate into the United States uh, through their exceptional abilities or through uh, their professional achievements uh, in various ways and in diverse ways. So uh, that is what this program is meant for, is purely educative. And let me pass this disclaimer that this is not a legal immigration advice, but this serves as just an educative piece to help students who are not able to even afford immigration lawyers to file application on their behalf, but want to take their risk, take want to be bold and take the initiative to file their own applications themselves. Like I said, my name is Daniel Aniniba and I'm going to lead you through this program today. So let's set the ball rolling. So uh, before we begin, uh, we go, uh, we zoom into uh, today's uh, episode. I want us to have a recap of uh, what we did last week. Uh, last week, we looked at interesting terminologies. And if you have not watched our videos for last week, please, I would advise that you go back and watch that video so you know where we started from, where we have gotten to, and where we are going, uh, which is very much good in this logical application so far as you are going to file this uh, green card yourself. Uh, so the terminologies, uh, what did we look at last week? Last week, we looked at the Na National Interest Waiver Green Card EB2. When we say EB2 itself, what does it mean? Uh, we also uh, looked at uh, exceptional ability as a term. What does it mean to say exceptional ability? What does it mean when we say national importance? Uh, what does it mean when you say your research even have merit? We also look at uh, what does it mean when you say your visa steroid is a retrogressed or current. Like I said, in the United States, people, some people are here in very high population. For instance, Indian students, Chinese students, who are always backlogged when it comes to visa numbers. So whenever they file green card, it takes about 10 years for them to get their green cards. Uh, for other nationals too, they are always current, therefore they are really assured that within some few months they can get their green card in hand. Uh, so we looked at all these terminologies, uh, which was very much interesting. Please, once again, I would advise that you subscribe to this channel, you comment, you share it in your graduate circles, so that we keep educating ourselves. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, today we are looking at misconceptions. Uh, what are the misconceptions surrounding this type of green card? There are a whole lot of misinformation around uh, where some people say, oh, you need a, to be a doctor, you need to, be, you know, to have a PhD to apply for this type of green card. Uh, is it true? Is it false? Uh, you know, one of the major misconceptions is that you need a PhD to apply for this type of green card. It's a huge misconception. It's, it, it, it's, it, it's a false uh, assumption. Uh, in fact, the United States Citizen and Immigration Service says that it's recommended that you have an advanced degree, like a master's degree or a PhD, but also made the provisions that if you don't have a master's or even a PhD, but you have a bachelor's degree uh, and can document like five years of progressive work experience, you can equally file for this type of green card. So it's not enshrined in immigration law uh, to have a... Uh, PhD or a master's before you can file this type of green card. Let's say you are uh, an accountant, you are an engineer, you are a nurse, uh, you are uh, an artist, uh, you, you, you are uh, excelling in your field, but you only have a bachelor's degree. Uh, you, if you can document that whatever you are doing is of significant importance to the United States, uh, and you can show some kind of success you have achieved in your field, I think you should be fine to be able to file this type of green card. So you see that it's a very big uh, misconception that you don't have to have a PhD to apply for this type of green card. And also, the United States citizen even says that it's either you have an advanced degree or an exceptional ability. It is an advanced degree and exceptional ability. So you can alternate between these two. Uh, people can may not have an advanced degree, but can show exceptional ability in different fields. 
or of in their field of or, or professional field of endeavor and that is will also be equally acceptable uh next episode we'll be looking at the national interest waiver green card application eligibility itself and we will document and we will look at all these things what the requirements are and for you to know whether you are eligible to apply for it or you are not eligible to apply for it uh so you see that you don't need a phd or even a master's is not a requirement, uh, strict, it's not a strict requirement to still file this type of green card. Now let's look at misconception number two. Oh, what is it? oh you need to be physically present in the United States to be able to apply for this type of green card. It's a very wrong assumption, very wrong assumption. In fact, you don't need to be physically present in the United States to apply for this type of green card. Wherever you are in any part of the world, uh, whether you are a researcher, whether you are a professional with some five years of experience uh, uh, and excelling in your field, every part of the world that you are, whether Australia, whether China, whether Japan, whether you are in Nigeria, whether you are in Ghana, whether you are in Mexico, uh, you still qualify to be able to apply from wherever you are. So you don't need to be physically present in the United States to apply for this type of green card. So let's look at misconception number three. Uh, this green card is for inventors or Nobel Peace Prize winners. Uh, that's what many people think. Oh, this green card should be for people who have invented something or who, who, who have won a Nobel Peace Prize. I would say that is very false. In fact, you don't need to be the Albert Einstein of our time to apply for this type of green card. Uh, neither, neither do you have to invent something, invent a drug. In fact, the United States Citizen and Immigration Service it's not that they are requiring that you are actively even showing that you are doing it. They look at the potential, the future. Are you well positioned to be able to do some of these things you claim you can do? That is what they are looking for. So they are not even looking for hardcore evidence which shows that actively you have even achieved whatever you are doing. Let's say you are doing a research which is going to uh, produce biofuel. And you are doing this thing in a smaller in a small scale, miniature uh, levels in the lab. Uh, that is enough. You don't have to show that you have produced uh, barrels of oil from bio-organic substances before you be granted this type of green card. So you see, uh, you don't have to be an inventor. Though uh, there are people who, through the exceptional ability, they document that they have patented research, uh, they have patented certain part of their outcome or findings in their research to be applicable in industry or companies. Uh, if you have that, it's great, but it's not a strict requirement that you should have a patent or you should have a product uh, to show before you can apply for this type of green card. So that is misconception number three. Now let's look at misconception number four. I need a lawyer to successfully file this green card. <laughs> It's a very wrong assumption. Uh, in fact, the USCIS officers, some of these officers are very happy when they see applicants who take up initiative to apply for these things yourself. You see, I always say this thing, that if you cannot explain your research to the United States government to get a green card, don't expect an immigration lawyer to do it any better for you. See, some of these immigration lawyers are, are not all that STEM-oriented. They are not science-oriented. Uh, they may not even understand your research. In fact, part of the reasons why some, most of this research get denied is that the lawyer is not able to present the candidate's uh, interest or explain the candidate's research very well. So right now, even it's a common trend where I see a lot of lawyers who want to file the national interest waiver hire scientific writers to be able to write and understand whatever their clients are talking about. Not a lot of people are so STEM freak or science uh, 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 STEM oriented, sorry, or, or science oriented to uh, be able to represent their clients. So if you can't explain your research to the United States government, then you have no business coming to the United States. You don't have any business even filing this green card. You have to be able to explain your research yourself. In fact, in a layman's language, so that the officer can understand it and approve your green card. So it's not enshrined for you to have uh, a lawyer to file this type of green card. So please take note of that. Misconception number five. You must be in the sciences to apply for this type of green card. Do you have to be a science-based researcher? No. In fact, uh, there is something called a matter of Denasa. And the matter of Denasa, this happened at some point in uh, immigration. There was a time that previously, some past times, the USCIS was uh, granting these green cards solely for science researchers. 
But it came to a time that there is this person by name Danasa. That's what happens in immigration law. He was bold enough to take the USCIS to court uh, and said, I see, I am in the business. I'm in the arts. I'm in the vocational field. I'm even an entrepreneur. And I can document that my skills is of great importance to the United States. And because they were able to do that and win that immigration case in course, it became a flagship uh, standard of practice. That's what happened in the United States. When somebody takes the government to court and wins the case, from henceforth, that particular case becomes applicable to other cases. So they say that they, they, from since that time, they removed that requirement to be in a science-based research. And now national interest waiver is applicable to anybody in any field, in the arts, in the business, uh, in the sciences, in uh, recent times, you have seen entrepreneurs taking advantage of it. Even athletes. Uh, there are people who come, want to play in the U.S. Major Soccer League, and you need a work permit to play. You need green card to stay permanently and work as a footballer. Uh, most of these, at times, even use the national interest waiver. So you have seen that you don't have to. You don't have to uh, strictly uh, be in the science field to apply for this type of green card. Uh, so let's look at misconception number six. This green card is only for academicians. So like I'm saying, you don't have to really even be in the academic field. There are people doing very great work in the industry. There are people getting great, achieving great feet in industry who can document awards, best employees, hardworking employees, uh, workers who have been able to trailblaze a very good uh, record for themselves at their places of work. Who can equally file this type of green card? So you don't strictly have to be in academia to apply for this type of green card. Misconception number six. Every immigration lawyer can help you file EB2 national interest waiver. Just like a misconception that you need a lawyer, let me also talk a bit about this one. Not all immigration lawyers are science-oriented. Like I said, maybe not all immigration lawyers specialize in national interest waiver filings. Uh, let me share this experience with you. I had a friend who wanted to go the lawyer route, and he contacted three lawyers wanting to file uh, the national interest waiver for him. And some of these lawyers replied that even national interest waiver, he needs a work a job offer. I said, really? Yes. That and after looking at the lawyer's background, I realized that he's not specialized in national interest waiver. And at times, because of uh, ego, because of they don't want you to tell you to, oh, we are not specialized in this field. Uh, some can be very honest with you and tell you, but some want to hide their ego and say, oh, I don't know much about national interest or whatever it is. Uh, not all lawyers are specialized in national interest. Some lawyers are specialized in asylum. They, are very, they have expertise in asylum cases. Some have expertise in domestic violence, green card. Some have expertise in different fields. Some have that expertise just in EB2 where an employer will hire you and hire him the lawyer to file for you. But I don't have the expertise even, even to go to the national interest with a level. So uh, that is what it is. Uh, not all lawyers are skilled or are, are, are kind of well groomed into national interest waiver cases and one thing with national interest waiver application is that it's not a common application you can just grab one or two sheets and file to the u.s government it is like writing your undergraduate project at times it's about 30 pages because you are writing a whole paragraph writing a whole chapter and explaining your research to the u.s government so when a lawyer see this kind of work involved he can probably look at six cases and make some money without looking at your case. So most lawyers try to shy away from it because it's very much document intensive and it's very a lot of typing and writing which they don't want to go into it. So that is to tell you that not all lawyers are specialized in uh, national interest waiver filings. Another misconception, I need a certain number of citations or publications to qualify. This is a very wrong assumption. In fact, the United States Citizen and Immigration website says that there is no set limit number of citations or uh, publications. Uh, I know somebody who filed his green card by just submitting his thesis or just using his thesis. Uh, whether it was filed online or submitted to the university, that is what he used. It, you see, when it comes to national interest waiver, it's not about who has a lot of citations that gets approved. It's about how you file it. 
Therefore, I've seen a lot of people who print out their citations, 100 citations, 150 citations, and the whole list of their publication and mail it to the USCIS, thinking that they are on the front seat, but it comes back that they are rejected. And there are people who have zero citations. In fact, as part of this episode, we are going to look at a case study application where the person has zero citation and just one publication, uh, just one which was just a thesis, still use that to get approved. So you don't have to have a set number of citations or a set number of publications for you to get approved for a national interest waiver green card. Another misconception, I must continue to work in the field for which I got my green card. Uh, yeah, this is a very uh, big misconception, uh, which people think, oh, once I got a green card as a data scientist, I'm supposed to still get into the data science and still work there or I'll be deported. Or uh, once I got a green card in environmental science, or once I got a green card in uh, biostatistics, I have to be doing biostatistics work. Uh, one thing that I would say is that it, it, it's not ethically right to get a green card and be doing different things, but uh, the USCIS have not enshrined this in law that you have to, that is strictly, you are, you are going to be punished for not working in your field. In fact, many people are of the school of thought, like I said, it's people's uh, suggestion that after getting your green card, at least you should try looking for a job for the first six months in the field in which you said you have your exceptional ability. Not, it's not very, it's not uh, uncommon to find people who are in toxic research laboratories leaving their lab to industries after getting their green card. People saying goodbye to your research and going to industry to do very great things and achieving great stuff. Uh, it's very not, it's not uncommon to see that. So you see, uh, uh, it's not a straight requirement, but in order not to be charged for visa fraud, you don't want to be given this type of green card and come to the United States and the next moment you are seen at McDonald's flipping burgers or you are seen doing dishwashing in a restaurant. Uh, no, 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 no. So please, this type of green card is for people who are ready to come and trailblaze very good professional path in the United States uh, to be able to help the United States economy grow in whatever field that they say they wanted to practice in. So that is one thing. Number nine. It's very difficult to get approved for national interest waiver green card. Yeah, whenever people go through and read about national interest waiver and see the documentary evidence they have to project, they get discouraged and they think that, oh, it has to be very difficult uh, for me to get approved for this type of green card. Uh, I would say it's a very big misconception. Uh, in fact, uh, I have seen that national interest waiver green card is one of the green cards with one of the highest approval rates that I can recall. Uh, and I took the time to uh, post a particular data. This type of data, as you can see, uh, shows a national interest waiver approval rate. That is what projected by a particular uh, immigration lawyer who specializes in national interest waiver, the North American Immigration Group, uh, Victoria Chen. Uh, she is also very good uh, in EB2 national interest waiver cases. Uh, so you see that this is the total application he filed 2015 to 2019. Uh, filing almost about 7,609 applications, and it returned that the National Interest Waiver had 99.24 approvals. Yes, 99.24 approvals. That means that if you put in the work, and if you do your work very well, if you do your research and your homework very well, you should, the visa officer have no reason to hold that green card away from you. Uh, so that is it. Uh, EB1A, like I said last in our last episode, that it's a green card that you you have to meet a higher bar to be able to get approved for it. And as you can see that even with that one, there's about 90% approval rate for that. So don't get discouraged that it's so much difficult to get approved for this type of green card. When you do your homework and when you put in the required work and you don't file any frivolous application just to buy space and time, uh, then you, you should know that you should be fine. And one thing that USCIS even does is that they don't reject your application outright. A USCIS officer will send you something they call request for evidence, RFE. The request for evidence is just an opportunity to give you a second chance to explain a portion of your research. Uh, so they don't just even reject your application outright. They give you the opportunity to explain certain parts of your application in further details. Uh, so please take note of that. Yeah, so as we can see from this same uh, source, we also found that upon all their green cards, different types of green cards, the National Interest Waiver Approval Rate occupied just even, yeah, more than half. You see this yellow portion adding to the blue portion, or it's NIW, which is a very 
it should be a very common way of documenting your stay in the United States without needing an employer or a job offer to stay in the United States. Now, misconception number thing. Applying for the National Interest River Green Card will deny my future U.S. visa applications or F1 visa. Uh, so, with this misconception, I'm going to be a bit strategic uh, and a bit... Uh, subtle in my explanation it depends on how you are going to file it in fact uh many immigration lawyers have said that filing the first petition there are two parts of the national interest waiver you first file a petition for a petition to get approved then you go ahead and file your adjustment of status if you are in the united states or you go to a consular processing to get an immigrant visa to enter the united states so whatever you do there's a first part that you file with the USCIS before you go to the second part. Some people do this concurrently to buy time because the adjustment of status takes a lot of time. And if you're in the United States, if you're already in the United States, you are under pressure to maintain status and you want a work authorization, people do that concurrently, filing it together to buy time to be able to get a work authorization. Uh, the moment you file concurrently, you have declared immigration intent to immigrate. And F1 visa is a non-immigrant intent. That means when you file concurrently, you are somehow kissing goodbye to your F1 visa. Still, some immigration lawyers debate about this thing, whether it's still going to buy you from getting future visa applic uh, application approved. But the advice is that don't travel out of the United States when you file concurrently. Uh, when you file your adjustment of status and you file your petition together. But for somebody who is, let's say, a PhD student or a student who is comfortably doing his research under no pressure at all to maintain any status or switch to any status, that person first file the first form, which is the form I-140, the petition for the National Interest Waiver. When the petition is approved, then you have the assurance, the guarantee that you can just go through the formality with the adjustment of status. So just mere filing the petition will not affect your visa status. For instance, uh, when it's, let's look at it from this perspective. When you have a parent who files a family-based green card for you, the person will file form I-131, which is petition to file green card for relative of a U.S. citizen. The mere fact that your father filed I-31 on your behalf doesn't mean when you get admission in a U.S. school, a visa consular officer should deny you because you have shown intent to immigrate. No, that is not it. Uh, in fact, the visa consular will have a problem with you when, after the petition was approved, you made an attempt to get the immigrant green card visa to enter the United States. That means you have previously declared intent to come to the United States and you are coming for F1 visa, that becomes a problem, uh, a tug of war between you and the visa officer. So that is the difference I want you to know. Whatever decision you want to take, that is why you have to know the risk involved, the pros and cons of whatever decision you will be taking, whether you are filing concurrently or you are playing a safe game by just filing the petition. Whether it's approved or rejected, it doesn't affect your visa status in any way. Misconception number 11, and this is going to be our last misconception to look at for the day. The USCIS hired professors and researchers to review and adjudicate cases. Uh, this is one big misconception that a lot of EB2 National Interest Waiver Green Card applicants always have. That, oh, the USCIS have found a room, very big room full of researchers and PAD and doctorates who are adjudicating this research so you can't afford to mess up. It's a very wrong misconception. In fact, it will surprise you to know that most of these people adjudicating the cases, some of them even have just high school degree or high school diploma and some with bachelor's degree. But that doesn't mean you can easily overrun them. Uh, or you can easily fool them because these guys have lost lots of experience and they are well trained to handle cases. So uh, that is why as part of your application, you have to explain your research in a layman's language. Most of them even are not in the STEM field. They don't even know what research you are talking about until you explain it in a layman's language. And from next episodes or upcoming episodes, we look at a particular Typical type of application where a person dedicated a whole paragraph to explain his research in an ordinary man's language. You know that when we do science research, we at times make the writing very complex. When you take a scientific article, you have to read and overread and read it again before you'll be able to make any meaning out of it, which at times doesn't help. If you apply that same concept into applying your new green card, you may get denied because the US officer probably didn't understand your research. So you are supposed to explain your research in the layman's language, but not also being too overly simplistic, but 
explaining your recessor that somebody in the non-science field can understand what you mean. So that is one thing to take note of. Once again, this is not a legal immigration advice. And this, if you think you have a very complex immigration situation, please, I would advise that you talk to an immigration lawyer. Uh, this is just an educative piece to help graduate students, especially African students, who have to go back home in disappointment because they didn't get that employer to file that green card for them, uh, who want to put together their own application and show the United States government that, see, if I stay in the United States, this and that that I'm doing is going to be of huge benefit to the United States. So once again, my name is Daniel Aniliba and I'm very much happy to have taken you through the whole of today's episode. So let us look at what is upcoming, the upcoming for next week. Next week, we are going to look at the introduction to the National Interest Waiver Green Card, eligibility, components, uh, the processing time, what it takes, and some money matters, the filing fees, and also the risk pros and cons. I talk about some of the risks today, filing concurrently versus filing separately. Uh, next week, we are going to look at uh, all these things and we look whether you will be eligible to apply or you are not eligible to apply. So stay tuned. Please subscribe, share and like and post your questions at the comment, se uh, comment section so that we can be able to address your questions. See you next week. Enjoy the summer. It's a very good summer out there. The sunshine is very fantastic. Enjoy it as I see you next week. Bye-bye.